One perhaps surprising fact is that it took 50 years from the original discovery of superconductivity by Kamerlingh Onnes in 1911 uh, before real practical applications developed. And the reason for this is quite simple. It took that long to find materials which would carry best possible current densities in high magnetic fields. Right, you all heard about nanotechnology. Nanotechnology, biotechnology, infotechnology. And it's interesting to think that superconductors are really inherent nanomaterials. And this all comes from the fact that superconductivity itself, which occurs by the pairing of electrons, this has a spatial range to it, which we call the coherence length, the superconducting coherence length. The coherence length was the distance through which a change uh, would spread. If you tried to change the superconductor at one point, it would spread through a distance xi. But if you have a dirty superconductor, where the electrons are being scattered by impurities all the time, then um, the coherence length will become shorter because the electrons will, will become decohered, you might say, by scattering before they've got as far as xi. When the free path is short compared with the natural coherence length, uh, in the end, the actual coherence length is quite short. Uh, and that means that superconductivity can change into a normal state very quickly. Uh, so impurities enable you to make, get a quick transition from normal to superconducting, and that is the condition under which you get a negative surface energy, and a condition under which superconductivity uh, likes to survive even above the critical field. This coherence length is, for most usable superconductors, in scale range of a nanometer to five nanometers. So these are truly inherent nanomaterials. And what we want to do is to understand and manipulate and control the microstructure on exactly this scale. Perhaps some of you have spent time in a lab where there was a very high field superconducting magnet, uh, let's say for a nuclear magnetic resonance. These have all been made out of two materials, niobium, uh, about 50 weight percent titanium, and an intermetallic compound, niobium 310. These have coherence lengths of 5 nanometers for niobium titanium, 3 nanometers for niobium 310. What is it that happens here? These are polycrystalline materials. They're made as very fine filaments, uh, anywhere from 50 to perhaps 5,000 filaments within a wire. The current, which is passing along kilometers of this wire end to end, and in fact one can make joints, which are perfect superconducting joints. So the supercurrent can go around and around forever and ever, even though the structural disorder at a crystal boundary when the crystal boundary forms this three-dimensional network through which the current has to flow. It has to go through millions and millions of these grain boundaries. And so at that nanometer of disorder, what happens to the Cooper pairs? Well, the miracle of superconductivity in niobium, and actually as we now discover in magnesium diboride too, is that nothing happens there. There's no problem at all in, in all the lotus sheet materials that we are using now. Grain boundaries are important in both niobium-310 and niobium-titanium as sources of flux pinning. In both cases, the critical current density, Jc, is inversely proportional to the grain diameter. The finer the grain size, the stronger the pinning, the higher the Jc. The way, in fact, you get the best properties out of something like niobium-titanium or niobium-310 is to stuff the material full of defects. In the case of niobium-titanium, we have these little second-phase particles of not superconducting, that's to say normal titanium, and we just make these one or two nanometers thick. And so we have this extremely dense array of these real nanoparticles, 20, 25 volume percent, not superconducting, sitting in a continuous superconducting matrix, and all of these interfaces have a wonderful effect on the way that flux, which is quantized in the superconducting state, and most of all, very important, is they can be pinned. We have core of pure niobium in a matrix 
of bronze. Under annealing, the tin reacts with the niobium to produce a layer of niobium-3 tin. And this grows in columnar fashion and the grain boundaries do not offer hindrance to flux lines. They are able to slide down the grain boundary. So we can have part of the flux lattice pinned within the grains and part shearing down the boundary. And what then governs critical Lorentz force is the shear strength of the flux line lattice. And it is this that gives us dependency of this form. So we have in niobium titanium a pinning force curve something like that, whereas for niobium 3 tin we have this very different shape. Point to notice about both of these curves is the fact that the pinning strength in niobium titanium falls quite rapidly as one approaches the upper critical field. This means that the critical current density can be quite high until very close to the upper critical field. Whereas disappointingly for niobium-3 tin, the pinning force and hence the critical current density falls long before we approach the upper critical field. Now of course what we want to do with these materials in the main is make magnets and we want our magnets to have high magnetic fields and for this we need high current density at the magnetic field the magnet is going to generate. The upper critical field may be of the order of 25 Tesla but it's very difficult to make a magnet that produces a field greater than the order of 20 Tesla. So anything we can do to increase the current density close to the upper critical field, that is to alter the shape of this curve, is going to be beneficial. What we have to do is we'll raise the shape of this curve uh, and we do that by refining the grain size, by developing annealing treatments which will give us a very fine grain size product. Crystal boundaries are excellent pinning centers. They're excellent pinning centers precisely because the superconducting properties are a little depressed. That little depression of the superconducting property is exactly what you need in order to give a binding energy of the vortex in that position. We can alloy to raise the upper critical field because of course at any given field the current density is going to be higher the higher the upper critical field. We alloy the niobium with material like tantalum or titanium. The other thing we can do is to try and introduce pinning centers into this part of the microstructure to block the flux shearing down the grain boundaries. And this is an approach which doesn't seem to have been uh, tried. The, the future therefore of, of niobium-3 tin is dependent upon the development of uh, elongated pinning centers which make the microstructure look rather more like niobium titanium than these, this columnar picture in niobium 3 tin. So that's what we mean by flux pinning. So you might say, well, how much is optimum? We actually don't know quantitatively, and this is one of the kinds of problems, I think, that still should attract people like yourself. At this scale of a nanometer or so, can you either experimentally or theoretically, or perhaps by some combination of both, really work out what is the optimum depression of the superconducting properties in order to provide the pinning strength without causing, therefore, a decoupling and a loss of superconductivity? That's an interesting question that we need young people, I think, to come and resolve and hear and study in greater detail.